Um, my name is Mark Kramer from Harvard University. I uh, am the director of the Cold War Studies program there and, and uh, senior fellow at the Davis Center. And um, I have, uh, here is a booklet, which I have, uh, I have over there. Is, um, there's a booklet in which there's a short essay that I discuss some aspects of patenting, especially with regard to what makes it distinctive. But the, uh, let, me, let me comment on a few points with regard to the collection that has just been made available. I should note, and um, Ellen Paul touched on this as well, that even though there were documents newly released in connection with this, uh, there already was a very large body of documentary evidence at NARA, at the presidential libraries. I'm going to comment on, on uh, some of that evidence. But so the uh, major thing I would say about that was the general contours of US policy were already quite well known. I, I'm not sure that the documents um, change any of that. They certainly enrich it and reinforce it. And especially, again, going back to the point that Ellen made is um, they, they make very clear the lack of any desire to shed any particular light on this. And what strikes me, again, in looking at some of the documents is not during the war. During, during the war, you, you can see a certain uh, rationale to having tried, if not to suppress information, at least not to harp on it. Um, Trade-offs of that sort are often made. They are made even in current U.S. foreign policy about, um, say, what's said about Saudi Arabia or other important allies. And those sorts of trade-offs aren't surprising, and in fact, you can even justify them to a degree. But the um, but after the war, it, it just stuns me to go back and look at, for example, during some of the. Uh, the documents. Let me, before I come to some of that, let me just say it was discussed in the presentation by the National Archives people, but let me just mention the documents pertain to quite a large uh, range of time. They do deal with the period um, from in the, uh, during the war. There are wartime documents. There are many documents pertaining to the Madden Committee era. And, and uh, also what Alan talked about the Army intelligence, but the um, some of those are very interesting as well to see, for example, why certain records were not turned over to the Madden Committee, especially the British role often in having um, insisted on keeping documents secret and in fact not even acknowledging that such information existed. The uh, there are documents from later. Uh, admin U.S. administrations as well. Most administrations going through uh, the Carter administration. And, um, and then there are also some interesting materials. It might sound uh, a little strange that they would be interesting, but they are from the early 1990s, uh, George H.W. Bush's administration. This was the administration that was in office at the time that the Soviet government in April 1990 officially acknowledged that Soviet forces were responsible for the massacres. And uh, then subsequently, in, uh, was also in office at the time in uh, October 1992 when the then Russian government of Maurice Yeltsin published very important documents showing the orders from Stalin and other members of the Politburo are following up on a memorandum from Lavrenti Beria, the head of the Soviet secret police. Now, since uh, that time in Russia, the climate has often changed a great deal <coughs> with regard to Katyn. Um, during that early period under Yeltsin, there was an enormous effort made, not, not so much by the government, but by Alexander Yakovlev and pushing for documents. On the other hand, there have been others in Russia who have consistently held out against that. I just got back yesterday from Moscow 
and picked up. This this book was published last week in Moscow by someone named Vladislav Shved. Uh, it's the Katyn Sabrovnina Historia Vakrosa, the Katyn uh, Contemporary History of the of the Question, and um, this is another example of a whitewash or an effort to <laughs> deny it. It, it is um, very critical of the. Russian government and the Russian parliament for having issued statements taking on culpability for the massacres. It's the type of thing, this was on sale in one of the major bookstores in Moscow, I'm disheartened to say. But with regard to the U.S. government, I do feel that um, there are, uh, particularly with the National Archives help now, there is a great deal more that um, can be put together with what was known earlier. The uh, scanning, I should add, and here again, I, it might sound like a small matter, but often scanning of documents is difficult to do, especially if you're dealing with things that are handwritten or that are uh, on stationery that doesn't scan well. But the National Archives really deserves a great deal of credit. I would say the documents, the scanning is excellent. Um, there wasn't a single item I came across that was illegible and the like, which um, is, is a very hard task to perform. I, I would like to find out what types of scanners. <laughs> um, but um, let me then come to a few items. This is one that was actually from the Roosevelt Presidential Library, and uh, this was referred to in the materials that from um, the, the new collection. This comes from the Henry Wallace papers at the Roosevelt Library. Henry Wallace was vice president in 1943 at the time that the, uh, the Germans came across the graves. And he was, um, he was contacted, sometimes, by the way, I should add, with documents, even if they are addressed to a particular official, you don't know that that official actually read them. There are many, many documents that go to government officials and they will not necessarily look at them. So even if you see something with a particular rooting list or something that is directed to the president, you can't always know for sure that the president or another official looked at them. In this case, you do know for sure that Wallace looked at this. He was contacted in uh, March of 1943 by Anna uh, uh, Jadulska from, uh, she was writing to him from London. She was, um, she and uh, another uh, Zhevanovsky um, were writing to him, uh, to Vice President Wallace from London. And they were, commenting on the disappearance of Polish officers who had been under Soviet captivity. And they provide a list of uh, about 25 or so names of officers, and they end, uh, the letter ends to him, may we appeal to you to help us throw some light on this tragic situation. Is there any way of coming to the rescue of these brave men whose only crime was to have fought for their country and she was attacked? Uh, we know for sure that Wallace saw, uh, read this letter because on the 20th of May, a couple of months later, he sent this memorandum to a particular individual. And I won't mention his name until uh, I just read the very brief text. This is from Wallace on the 20th of May. Dear Larry, is it possible and advisable to do some discreet work on the problem which this woman uh, presents? Uh, the recipient of this memorandum was Lawrence Duggan, who was head of Latin, it's a strange choice you might think, uh, he was head of Latin American affairs in the State Department at that point. And you might wonder why um, Vice President Wallace chose to uh, address this memorandum asking about the Zhadulska um, letter to the head of Latin American affairs. But Lawrence Duggan is now known as a Soviet spy. He, he was, his identity as a Soviet spy was 
disclosed in the Venona papers initially and then more recently in the Vasiliev notebooks of transcribed Soviet intelligence documents. Now, Wallace didn't know that, but, uh, but Wallace did know that Duggan was perhaps the most left-wing uh, official in the State Department. Now, why would he have contacted somewhere? Probably because he felt that Duggan would have some sense of, can we press this matter without offending Soviet Union? <coughs> so again, you can see that calculation there. On the 9th of June, uh, there was a, an official from the advisor on political relations in the Department of State who relayed Duggan's response. Mr. Duggan feels that no reply should be made to the latter. So that, that again, it's not to say Henry Wallace was not the top policy maker in Washington at that point. And in fact, um, President Roosevelt knew Wallace's leanings, and it wasn't Wallace's decision. But it still is very interesting, I think, to see some of the people involved here. Lawrence Duggan obviously had very little interest in seeing anything done on that team. You know, he would do his best to cover it up. I had no idea until I saw these documents that Duggan had even been consulted about this matter. Um, there are other materials as well that bring to light the, uh, the extremely important information that was provided very early on, and then no one followed up on it. Uh, Ellen mentioned several of these. and. What is striking is how much these people knew, uh, not only Van Vliet, but several others, Alan touched on, people in the British government as well. And here, again, looking at the Madden Committee, your, uh, your, uh, the, the later documents from the early 50s during the Madden Committee hearings, was um, what again struck me was how often the British would object to the release of documents, and, and even, again, to the point of saying that they wanted to deny that such information existed. There was an item from 1992 as well. This was, again, George H.W. Bush's time in which someone responding to a letter from a Polish-American, this was in the wake of the disclosure in Moscow of, of particular documents. Uh, this the um, Polish American letter writer who was trying to get President Bush to follow up on this and to press further in investigating the crime and of possibly looking into doing something in the international tribunals about it. That uh, the State Department of, or, uh, official who wrote back finally after many attempts to get someone to respond said that until April 1990, that is until the statement by the Soviet government, that we did not have sufficient information to determine what had happened in Kathy. Now, I think um, for some, now he may well have uh, not really known much about it. He was just someone assigned to it. But here was someone trying to clarify the matter repeatedly and to see a U.S. official respond, um, or someone assigned who didn't really know enough to respond properly, is disheartening. Mm -hmm. So here as well, and where I'll end, is uh, to say that if you take a look at these documents, I think they will make you aware uh, that there were a people who knew a great deal and who were able to push on it from an early stage. But you will also see what's much more disheartening is the large number of people who either wanted to suppress information or at least just had no particular interest in moving ahead in the disclosure of it. Uh, thank you very much.